Hello, happy Thursday before a half day, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us tonight for our third Lions Lecture and the final for the spring semester. Um, this event itself is a joint venture between the Graduate School and our College of Innovation and Design. And we always hope that this event is one that brings you some entertainment over the next hour as our distinguished speakers take the stage to share their interests, um, their passions, and special projects that are near and dear to their heart. Tonight, our speakers are Dr. Bob Williams and Dr. Michael Oldham. Each will speak for 20 minutes, and then after they speak, we'll open the floor for any questions. I'll be finding you with the microphone so that way we can hear you in this space. Um, please feel free to enjoy our wonderful bar in the back. We have the best bartenders in town. And um, I would like to invite Dr. Dobbs to the mic to say a few words to introduce our first speaker. All right, thank you. Um, these notes from Dr. Schrader say, including any announcements or special comments. And so the first one is I'm here on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Jen Schrader, who can be here tonight. Um, Dr. Bob Williams is professor of sustainable agriculture and food systems and graduate program coordinator for agricultural sciences. He teaches a variety of courses and conducts research and outreach related to people, places, and processes involving getting food from farm to fork or to fingers. One graduate course that Dr. Bob has taught for several years is Water Issues and Ethics. The course includes a critical review of water use, availability, and allocation from local, state, and national and global perspectives. This talk will focus on Texas and specifically the pending, rural, uh, pending regional water wars between Dallas-Fort Worth and its expanding uh, metroplex and rural Northeast Texas. Dr. Bob is currently in his 24th year as a faculty member, which is as long as I've been here, which is good, and his 45th year in public education. He has taught and served as an administrator in public schools and community colleges prior to joining the faculty here. He holds a BS in agricultural education and the MS in agriculture from East Texas State University and a doctorate in family and consumer science education from Texas Tech University. Please enjoy me in welcoming Dr. Bob Williams to the stage with his talk, Damn, I wanted to say that all day, Damn, Texas Water Wars and the Implications for All of Us. I got this. You got it? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Can everybody hear me? Uh, all right. Uh, so, um, I will start out by saying that I'm technologically illiterate, especially when it comes to screens in front of people. Um, so much so that when I did my doctoral dissertation defense a billion years ago, I took my high school senior daughter to make sure that all technology worked according to plan. And thanks to her, it did. Um, uh, so so I, I will say this up front, that most of this is, uh, uh, most of these slides are from the Texas State Water Plan for 2022. And they're just images I stole to give us something to talk about. So we'd like to take a moment just to recognize that the land that we are here today on this university sits on, as well as most of the land in Northeast Texas was once inhabited by the Caddo Nation, um, the Caddo people, um, various tribes um, relocated to Northeast Texas and East Texas after uh, the Louisiana Purchase and after they, they uh, got bumped out or crowded out, they moved to Texas. Um, and then they got moved again and again. Um, their headquarters now is in Binger, Oklahoma, and uh, that's, um, uh, you know, we will see why we're talking about this. Very important to understand that um, resettlement of peoples is a part 
of human evolution. And uh, good, bad, indifferent, we're going to give you some thought on that as we move along uh, in this presentation. Uh, but there was once another people here besides us. So this dam, uh, I got to say it, dam. Uh, uh, this dam is the dam for the Sulphur Springs Reservoir on White Oak, which White Oak uh, Creek feeds into the South Sulphur River, and uh, or into the Sulphur River. And um, one of the reasons why I use this particular picture, it's not a very good one, but it's the only one I could find of the Sulphur Springs Dam, is because this was my first introduction to public water works. I was a kid, my dad was a construction worker who helped to build this dam. And um, I recall conversations about people who had farms and ranches and homes in the floodplain of this lake um, who were negotiating with the uh, Sulphur Springs Water Authority to, um, to try to, you know, get as much as they could for the land that they were having to sell under in intimate domain. Um, so a little bit of historical perspective there. Okay, so to start out with, water, we all know water is essential for us. It's an essential element of our lives and of all lives. And um, so the more people we have, the more water we need. The more water we need for people, the more water we need for the places where those people are, the products that those people consume, the food those people consume. So the yellow here is, oh, whoa, whoa. I knew that was going to happen. Thank you, Sierra, for telling me how this thing operates. Notice how well I follow directions. Okay, so this yellow represents... Projected growth from 2020 through 2070. The Texas Water Development Board is responsible for making water plans um, 50 years in advance. That, so, so they're already working on what kind of water needs we have for 2070. And we'll continue to, to work on that. Um, and you can tell from 1850 until 2070, we're expected to pretty much double our, almost double our population in Texas. Uh, well, from 2020 to 2070, we're expected to double our population. Um, and so that's going to require quite a bit more water. And um, this is the projected water needs by acre feet. That's about 360,000 gallons of water uh, an acre foot is. But I don't want you to worry too much about that. I just want you to look at the percent change. Percent change from municipal water between 2020 and 2070, 1,362% change, or 1,362% increase in the amount of water needed for municipal water use. That's cities. Um, the others, uh, some are uh, all, all but mining uh, increase, but not nearly to the level. Uh, almost all of these others are relatively flat compared to mun municipal uh, water uh, demand increases. Now, um, there are water wars going on, arguments, gripes, complaints, lawsuits, Lawsuits between states, between Texas and its borders, between Texas and Mexico, between the United States and Mexico, um, between counties, between cities. There are all kinds of water conflicts going on currently in Texas. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of them. We're not going to talk about uh, the underground water rides or anything like that. We're going to talk about this area right here, the Sulphur River Basin. That's us. Um, commerce, right there on that line between Hunt and Hopkins and Delta County. 
Um, actually, we're right about right there in that intersection. Um, and 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 most of you know that that South Sulphur River runs between Commerce and Campbell, between between Commerce and Sulphur Springs. It feeds into Cooper Lake or Jim Chapman Reservoir uh, is the official federal name, but we all call it Cooper Lake. Um, and um, then water runs downstream, Middle Sulphur, South Sulphur, North Sulphur all converge into Sulphur River that goes on down and eventually runs into Lake Wright Patman close to the um, uh, close to Texarkana. Um, and we'll see a picture of all of those lakes here in just a minute. But these, uh, all of these uh, are are different water authorities in this. This is a map of the Texas water authorities, and there's a Sulphur River Water Authority. Sulphur River Water Authority, their responsibility is water quality and to make sure that the water continues to flow in Sulphur River. They don't have a whole lot of authority beyond that, uh, but they're, they're basically there to protect the water from pollution and those sorts of things. Uh, these are the proposed reservoirs over the next 50 years that, are in, that, that, that have been recommended in the state water plan to be developed within the next 50 years. A plan and a permit are two different things. I think that was the title of an article that I read uh, in preparation of this. There, there is no permit yet for construction of Marvin Nichols, which is what we're going to talk a little bit more about as we go along. But most of you are aware that Bodark Lake is now catching water, recently constructed, and it's about, I think, about 35, 40% full. And uh, Lake Ralph Hall, over here between, between here and Honey Grove, is, is under construction at this time. Uh, so those are, those are two relatively new lakes now. Lake Ralph Hall is in the uh, sulfur watershed. Uh, Bodark Lake, I believe, feeds into the red. But um, so, so this is one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is this is near and dear to our region. But it's also the closest water to Dallas or the closest possible water to Dallas. And, and so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But yeah, the, so, so these two lakes here, they're already going to be providing water for Dallas. It's, it's not water for Bonham. It's not water for Dodge City. It's not water for Ladonia and, and, and water for uh, Honey Grove or Commerce. It is water for the Metroplex. Now, they, the, those municipalities may be able, may have negotiated for part of the water. I'm not really too familiar with what they have in their agreements, but, but every time a lake is built, they have the water footprint, the, flood, the area that's flooded by the lake, or, uh, and then they have to have about twice as much, whatever that acreage is, they have to have about twice that much in a, of additional land for mitigation natural resource mitigation for uh, wildlife, habitat, and that sort of thing is displaced by the water. And then they also have to, uh, many times, uh, things like cemeteries or other uh, important landmarks have to be relocated. And so they have to have a place for that. So uh, generally, uh, mitigation on these types of projects requires about twice as much um, land as whatever the water footprint is. So uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, fortunately for Bodark, uh, the, the Bodark Lake, there was one gigantic ranch up, uh, river by ranch up on the Red River that they were able to negotiate with for mitigation purposes, a good plus for the folks that own river by, but also um, it, uh, it worked out to where they did not have to move a lot of other landowners off for that mitigation. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I, I haven't been able to keep up too much with what's going on at Lake Ralph Hall, 
because all of a sudden it, it just started. And um, so um, anyway, uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Marvin Nichols. This, this shows the sulfur, the, the sulfur um, water basin, and this is the proposed footprint for Marvin Nichols. This is right, Patman. We just see the end of Cooper Lake or uh, Chapman Lake over here uh, in Sulphur Springs. The Sulphur Springs, the dam, that, that's, that's how big it is compared to this one. Uh, some of y'all are familiar with Pat Mays Lake up near uh, Paris. Um, right, Patman is a pretty big lake, but it's not anything like what Marvin Nichols will be. About 68,000 acres of flooded water. Um, uh, are, are their, their footprint will be about 60,000 acres. And they anticipate because of the, the timberland and the ecosystems that that displacement will have, that they're going to have to have about another 150,000 to 200,000 acres of land for mitigation in that particular area. So if you double the size of this and add that around it, there's not going to be much left for the private land ownership in Titus. Well, that part of Titus, Red River, Franklin, and Morris counties. It's going to cover a lot of territory. And, and so remember, all of this area was once Caddo country. That was the homeland for the Caddo nation or the Caddo tribes. Um, they didn't become the Caddo nation until later. Um, uh, but, the, um, but anyway, so we look at political. How are we doing on time? Okay, very good. All right, so, so we start talking about some of the political elements involved in this. Um, I, um, right now, we've got Region C, which is the Dallas area, and you can pretty much tell there's Rockwall County, so there's Dallas County, Collin, and so on. Um, we, it's kind of like, it looks like they do a little gerrymandering for water, like this high population, high population dense area through here with lots of voters and lots of people. And then there's old Northeast Texas over here, Region D. Primary industries in Region D, with the exception of a little oil and gas industry down here around Longview, the primary uh, uh, is agriculture and timber. A lot of paper mills over here around Texarkana, uh, a lot of uh, beef cattle operations, uh, hay, grass, some crop production, a lot of poultry production in this particular area. Um, there'll be about four school districts impacted on taxes by that land, you know, that's public land. They don't have to pay taxes once it becomes on the water. The Water Authority is a quasi-state agency, so it doesn't have to pay taxes. Now, it's my understanding that they're trying to negotiate with the, the folks here in the, the the board in Region C and Region D are trying to negotiate to try to come up with a, an agreement to help offset the loss of taxation for the school districts and county governments in this particular area. But whether that happens or not um, w we, remains to be seen. This, this is such a pretentious argument that the state water board told Region C and Regions D to work it out. That they have, they delegated the authority to these two groups to figure out because Region C says, yes, we want to build Marvin Nichols. 
And Region D says, oh, hell no. We're not giving up our land for you to water your lawns. Now, I did mention irrigation, but irrigation is, that's agricultural classification. Irrigation of lawns takes almost as much water in, in Region C as the irrigation in, for agriculture in Northeast Texas. Uh, but um, that's not the big thing. The big, the big use, the big increase in water is that population that we talked about earlier. So let me go back to this, this previous slide. So this is a projected growth uh, in population between 2020 and 2070 uh, with uh, this darkest color being over 200% increase then 100, 200% increase. So you can see that, uh, well, we got a little bit, this, this is us right through here. So we're going to increase by about 100% in the next 50 years. And we're in the edge of, of Region D. But this section is going to increase by 200% or more population. So... They can definitely outvote us in any given election. Oh, well, we're here in the middle. We're probably going to want our toilets to flush, and we're going to want our lawns lush. So we might be more aligned with them. And we do, by the way, have each county in each one of these uh, water development districts has a representative. Hunt County has a representative, Hopkins County, Delta County, they all have representatives. So generally they do solicit input from the people in their county. How many of y'all have, have, have been a soli any input solicited by your water development board member? Yeah, that's what I thought. They have public hearings and they publish those public hearings somewhere. Used to, they would announce those public hearings in the newspaper, but they don't do that anymore because nobody reads newspaper. <laughs> All right, I got to get back to my deal. So these are the closing points that I'd like to leave you with because I'm told that I have less than one minute. Uh, these are some things for you to think about. It is going to get politically and geographically divisive, but um, there are lots of other things to think about. There will be people displaced once again in Northeast Texas because intimate domain basically demands that those with the most power get to usurp the rights of those with less. Thank you. Dr. Bob, if you'll stay. Oh, no, I don't want to answer any questions. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? If you do, can you just give me a hand so I can walk the mic over to you? Now, Peyton, I already told you you can ask me. <laughs> so, obviously, eminent domain is kind of the the general definition of it is for the better of the general population, correct? Or roughly? Well, intimate domain basically uh, is the right of a government entity to take property as long for the benefit of the greater good. Whatever the greater good is, greater probably means more population or more dense population in this particular case. but. They say fair and just compensation. Now, I was having an argument earlier with a scientist friend of mine, not today, but um, he's, he wants facts, figures, numbers, all that kind of stuff. And he, he wants to prove it. Uh, I'm kind of more on the social science side, and I have a tendency to try to use emotion to sway people to my way of thinking. And so, uh, but, but this is one of the things. Is, is it the people who might be displaced from their work or their homes or their communities? 
their ancestors from their cemeteries and so on. You can't put a price, a dollar price on that, especially when some of those people have been here for, you know, six, seven generations. One thing about it, if they are displaced for construction of a lake, they will get some compensation, which is a hell of a lot more than the Caddo Nation got when they were displaced. Correct. Uh, but where I was going with the eminent domain is when do we start considering food and fiber more important than the water rights? I've had the pleasure of working on some of, some of those ranches that are soon to be covered up in water, and that's prime cattle grazing of northeast texas when do we start consider uh agriculture over the the use of water well now peyton had you heard they're going to grow all the new food in the labs and we're not <laughs> going to have to grow them on the ground i prefer mine raised in the, in, uh, on the grass <laughs> uh, so uh the um the, i don't know when that's going to be probably whenever courts get involved but once again where the courts usually align themselves with, with the folks who appointed them. Well, thank you so much, right, Dr. Bob, if hey, we give him another round of applause. If, if y'all wanna know more about water, summer one, water issues and ethics, be glad to have you. <laughs> and a plug for the class. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to bring back up to the stage, Dr. Dobbs, to introduce our next speaker. All right, thanks, Dr. Bob. Tension between private rights and Public good is as old as the Republic. So up next, we'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Michael Oldham. Dr. Michael Oldham is a renowned human performance practitioner and researcher. He holds a PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition, exploring human performance, stress, and recovery. Dr. Oldham's 30 years of experience as a coach spans across a variety of youth, collegiate, and professional sports including a consulting role with the U.S. women's national soccer team prior to the 1996 Olympics. His research mission at A&M Commerce is to serve the public by cutting-edge research that is designed to optimize the human condition. And his team is uh, composed of researchers, certified professionals, and tactical professionals with a singular goal of providing the most comprehensive preparation possible for the first responder and tactical communities, enabling a long, healthy career of public service. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Oldham in his presentation, The Human Heart, The Beat of a Different Drummer. Dr. Bob, you didn't know I brought my own fan club with me, so I appreciate that. All right, um, thank you for coming today. And so we have a, a little task here for you. Rhythm, and so my, I have a question for you. Do you think you have rhythm? We're going to find out. Yes. Yes is the strong, strong yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit that little play button down there for me, sir. Your job is to stay with the rhythm. Got it? Down, keep coming down. Okay. Bingo. All right, got it? And clap. Not kidding when you said no. <laughs> I played a trick on you. Um, so that's actually me uh, playing. So look, how close were you to the rhythm? Reasonably close. Some of you, some of you struggled. Did you feel a tug, one way or the other, to listen to me or to the track? Right. It's not uncommon. This is the. This is what we're going to talk about today. Is this tug of how the heart feels when it's put under demands. So that rhythm is something that's internal within us that we have innate in every cell, but the heart especially is kind of an interesting little organ in regards to this. 
may recognize this. This looks like a, just a, the, the ECG, right? You may have seen these. Hopefully, you've never been hooked up to one of these. But you see this as an, uh, an example of what the heart is going through as an electrical instrument. The peaks and valleys here represent changes in the electrical activity of the heart, which causes it to contract. It is a reactive organ. And so it can slow down and it can speed up given input. So what it really is is just re reacting to a particular input set. This would be a normal heart rhythm. I'm sure you can read this, right? This is, and it was obvious to me when I saw it, so of course. There's problems here, and so this is what we consider a 12-lead ECG strip. It's taken literally over six seconds, and a cardiologist or a trained cardiotherapist can read this instantaneously and look at it and say, wow, I see the problem. The problems are right here. We see these problems, little changes and minute changes. That one right there is a big one, right? This is an indication of a heart that's been damaged through a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. So this, it looks normal to maybe the, the normal person, but this one is super simple to, to look at from a, from a cardiologist standpoint. So we can look at this and say, okay, where are the problems in the heart? How can we examine the heart? The heart itself, much like the track uh, that you heard, uh, I'm a, I am a drummer, actually, and I play to a metronome in my ear uh, when I play with a band. And it helps keep me in time so that I keep the band in time. Right? Does that make sense? So if the, if the band is following me, I'm at least on track. And so we have our own pacemakers within ourselves that keep the heart rate in check. The normal one is called the SA node, and that's kind of our main pacemaker. Normally somewhere around 100 to 110 beats per minute. But I know I'm an exciting speaker, but... I know your heart rates aren't at 110 right now, right? I, I mean, good, but not that good. So if left to its own devices, the heart would actually increase to around 100 to 110 beats. Just let it go by itself. The individual cells, they can actually sync up to themselves. So that's our primary pacemaker. So we're trying to hold it down to about that. The atrial fibers, the top fibers of the heart, actually slow it down even more. So somewhere between 60 to 100 beats. You can kind of see a trend that's happening here. As we travel further down the heart, the heart wants to become slower because it's more powerful. So the AV node, the secondary pacemaker, actually keeps it around 40 to 60. And then the Purkinje fibers, the fibers that stretch out, and you can kind of see them here, the little fibers that stretch out around the, the lower chambers, the bigger chambers of the heart, actually are somewhere between 15 and 40 beats per minute. Pretty slow, actually, right? This is, somewhere around turtle speed in terms of heart rates. In the end, we have a big way of actually putting the brakes on the heart. And it is a, a nerve called the vagus nerve, not like Viva Las Vegas or El, Elvis or whatever stays, happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas, not that kind of Vegas, different Vegas. This is a, one of the cranial nerves that runs right down behind the heart and it actually slows the heart rate down. It's the brakes of the heart. Remember we said the heart rate really wants to rush into it. If you've ever been in junior high and at a dance, you kind of already know that the heart, the heart wants what it wants. But is that heart rate, if we actually looked at it from a standpoint of beats per minute, and if I said it's 60 beats per minute, we would think that it's how many per second? One, very good, right? Dr. Green, newest dean of our college, you, you get to stay, good job. So we would think, yes, it'd be exactly right. We would think it'd be one beat per second. Well, it couldn't actually be further from the truth. And you can see that here in a six second lead, but it's kind of off, isn't it? Right? If these are one second bursts, it's a little short or it's a little long. And so, and in fact, we can actually measure this. We measure it at, for this first span, from the peak to the peak at somewhere between around 0.859 seconds, right? So just short of a second. The second one's fairly close, 0.863. But then you can see what's gonna happen here. This one is almost doubled at 1.612. 1.61, uh, 161. And then we kind of come back a little bit somewhere in between, so 0.960. We can take those variations, and we term it heart rate variability. And that's actually a good thing. We want that variability in our heart rate. 
how do we actually measure that and how do we quantify that? Because it's, if you took your radial pulse right now and looked at a clock, you could tell what your heart rate is in a particular time period, but you couldn't really measure that variability very good. So we can actually measure that. We can quantify it for our instrumentation. We can do some fancy math called root means of successive differences between normal heart rate, RMSSD. You can put it into this lovely formula, I know. You wouldn't think that, I mean, I, I just blow soccer balls up, right? That's all we do in kinesiology. You just blow soccer balls up, shoot baskets, roll them out, off we go, blow the whistle. We can actually do math, so like here it is. So this is actually the formula for our MSSD. And that, what that actually gives us is a nice little usable number, right? For the, for the practitioner, for the athlete, for the, um, uh, for the actual participant. So normal HRVs range between 30 and 110 milliseconds. So if you look at those times back in the last slides, that's out to that third decimal, right? 30 of those to 110 of those. So that's a good thing. This is a healthy range. But just like the tug that you felt between my rhythm and the track's rhythm, the heart feels the same tug. It feels the same tug between speeding up the heart rate and slowing down the heart rate. So the tug is between the sympathetic nervous system, which wants to speed it up, right, the angry heart, <laughs> and the parasympathetic nervous system, which wants to slow it down. And that tug of war is a beat by beat tug. It's a minute by minute tug, it's a day by day tug for your entire life. And so that, that constant tug of war really is a good thing. Like we said, a higher variability, right, where we're moving that heart rate between 0.86 and 1.8 and 0.9, those are good things. It means that we can actually adjust to micro changes. And I see, as you nod your heads, your blood pressure changes minutely. As you move your hand, your blood pressure changes minutely. And so the heart rate to keep blood flow to the head has to stay constant for those micro changes in pressure. So enable to us, uh, what heart rate variability does, it enables us to change to not only the micro changes, but the macro changes. So as we move and as we walk and as we exercise, which everyone should be doing 30 minutes a day, five times a week, we can adjust to that. Did I get it all in there? there we go. A lower HRV is not necessarily a good thing, right? It actually means that we're not variable. In essence, the heart rate, the vagus nerve says, okay, I got you to take care of this, and we have a higher vagal tone, and it lowers the heart rate, and it regulates it. So that now we have a heart rate that's at closer to that 1.0 per second. So in the end, the lower the heart rate, you're actually is an indication of stress, overwork, and a need to recover. You need vagus. <laughs> I think there was, there was something in that. I don't know what that is. So is my HRV normal? That's always what I read. Well, then what's my HRV? Is, and am I okay? Is that good? I don't know. So HRV inherently, just by its name, is variable. It's variable between you and me and every person sitting next to you, but it's also variable within me. So now, minute by minute basis, that's going to change. So you are you, and it's highly individualized. So when we do studies, it's very common for our participants to compare, but we don't want them to compare because you are you. What we do know is this is kind of the range, right? So um, here I am at 21. Um, so normally, no. Um, yes, this would be my son in here, right? So, somewhere between 60 and 110, 105 uh, as a f uh, middle 50. But here I am out here. Somehow I wound up in the tank again. I'm not sure how that happened, but somewhere between 30 and 50, and I, I actually do wear a device. Um, uh, this talk is not sponsored by Whoop, but um, uh, so I have to get that in there. But uh, I, I monitor my HRV daily. And so this really is my range. It, it, it's true to the, to the data. And so it seems that as we get older, our heart takes over and takes care of us more and says, okay, you're less likely to be able to handle the change but it, we can change it. So here's how we're going to change it. 
trends overall. It's not about the daily basis. It's about the long term. So this is actually my HRV data over a six month period from July of last year to just January of, the, of this year, right? And you can see some green, some yellow, and some red. Green indicates a really good recovery day. Yellow indicates eh, moderately good. You can go ahead and train. And red means, what are you doing to me? My body is not a temple at this point. But if you look at it, you can, and since you have the 10,000 foot view up here, it's a little mishmashy. But if you look at it from the 10,000 foot view, you generally see a what? Kind of an increase here, right? Going from kind of the middle of the road, we kind of see a little bit of an increase, or at least that's just maybe hopeful thinking. But that's true. I, I did have a general increase in my HRV over about a six month training cycle, right? For me, that's really important. There's me. That was, right? That's an uh, Ironman competition. Uh, this was actually in July um, and uh, had been training for six months prior to that. And so this is me finishing in New York. What are the applications in, in uh, some of the varieties and, and uh, and areas. Um, so I will say that all of the data that we have uh, to date started in the McNair Trio, Dr. C, Dr. D here, started in the McNair Trio program with one student and eight of these whoop straps, with eight firefighters. That study then progressed to uh, the uh, uh, college providing us with a larger grant, and then that expanded out to the early studies of this, and then we were able to progress that even further to now uh, we're working with some entities where we'll be somewhere in the 5,000 to 10,000 participants um, across the United States. Um, in this study, we're calling this the Recovery Standard Project. And we're looking at firefighters and how well they recover. So one of the ideas is, you know, if you think about this, they're on for 24 off for 48, sort of the regular firefighter schedule that we hear about, versus a 48 on, off for 96. So on for two straight days, and off for four. So inherently, you might be thinking, oh, you know what, I wonder which one recovers better. What do you think? Left, 24, 48, or right? Yeah, right, everybody thinks that. Because you're only working one day. So here's what it looks like. This is the recovery scores for the art study participants, and we see, that, so when it says shift day, this is the recovery after the shift day. And then this is after their first day off, OD1. And then after their first day off, their second day off, when they're about to go on shift. They got a little worried about going on shift again. Or they may have partied too much on that first day off. I don't know which, they're firefighters, it's okay. But what do you see here? So if this is recovery percentage, they just kind of recover about 53 to 58%. Here's the 4896. Ah, it's striking, isn't it? It's the most obvious thing that we can tell. What we can tell is that first day, pretty awful after shift. Second day, they get a little bit better because they're, what we hear from them is they're, they're familiar with their sleep surroundings again, right? They came back on, they've been sleeping at home for four days, and now they have to sleep in the bunk. So it's gonna trash their sleep a little bit. But they get a little bit more used to it and they get better. That first shift day is a little hard on them, so after the first day off, they're getting a little worse. But now the overall trend though, they get up to 62% recovered. In the grand scheme of things uh, for HRV, that's at about, so 69 is about the top of the yellow range, 70 passing would be great, would be green, ready to go, green light, do whatever you wanna do. So they get almost fully recovered in that four days. Staggering, right? We have a year-long study with a company in, uh, with a fire company in Virginia looking at a little different perspective. They're on one day, off another. On another day, off another. On another day, off for four days. It's called a Kelly schedule. We're interested to see what that one is. And there are fire companies around the United States that are looking at these studies to identify what they can do for their municipalities. Overall, the importance for firefighters, heart attacks and cardiac events are the number one killer of firefighters. Not the fires, cardiac events. 
And what we know is from the Framingham studies that lower HRV leads to higher cardiovascular risk. If we can fix this for them, we can extend the careers of our lifelong firefighters. What affects HRV? You know this. Inherently, you already know this. Ooh, stress. It's a big one, yeah? Stress is going to lower HRV. Are we eating correctly? Right? If we eat well, our HRV comes up. We recover. If we fuel the car, the car runs. We have good mental health awareness. And I won't even say good mental health, but if we have awareness, I'm stressed. I need to step outside of this. Okay. Sick, certainly. Um, HRV was able to predict COVID cases as HRV goes down and respiration rate goes up. 99% of the time, they were able to predict COVID. Exercise, not hard. 30 minutes a day, five times a week, 150 minutes, moderate exercise. Exercise is medicine, there we go. Hydrated, not drinking. I, I don't know. <laughs> hydrated, hydrated with water, right? The, it's an, easy, it's an easy problem. If we hydrate, we increase our blood volume, our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes down. It evens out. Hydrate. Lastly, this is the biggest one, sleep. We'll talk about this here in a second, just lastly as I wrap up. But sleep is the number one indicator. And you can see now why firefighters and shift workers and police officers and our military operations that we deal with, this is our number one problem. Okay? So it's not necessarily sleep more, but it's sleep better. Can we change how you sleep? Can we put the phone down an hour prior? Can we stay away from the blue screens? Can we read at night? Can we spend time relaxing prior to going to sleep, right? Uh, I mean, some of you are just with Instagram reels, right, just in the middle of it, right? Flip up, another one, yes, like it. Exercise, just get up and move. How much? 30 minutes a day? Five oh, times a week, good job, All right. Avoid alcohol, it's a hard killer. There is no known dose of alcohol that's acceptable for the heart. Eat well. All things in moderation. Does this diet work? Yes. Does this diet work? Yes. They all work. Everything in moderation. Eat well. And then spend time outside. If you can spend time the first hours of the day where you can get sunlight into your first hours, awesome. Turn off the phone the first hour of, of your day. You will increase your HRV. You will recover better. I'd like to thank a and Commerce for funding these studies, Dr. Green for funding our lab, uh, with the college, Dr. Culpepper, our, our, um, our department chair, Dr. Bernhard, who's here, Hassan Jabai, who's my research partner as well, graduate students, yeah. These, these studies produce thousands and thousands and thousands of data points, and it's their job to deal with it. Uh, Paula Flores was our original through Dr. D, and then Amy Sprague is my honors college student currently who's working through our data questions. Any questions? I have a question about that alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I need the mic. Uh, the, so the next deal, you said everything in moderation, but not alcohol. Not alcohol. Not alcohol. I can show you all the data where, and this is from our firefighters who self-report, that the next, if they consume one drink, their heart rate variability drops 20 points the next day. And these are, these are people who are under high stress and mm -hmm. are prone to self-medication and self-therapy. So. Yes, sir. Same studies, right? Same shift work. With, with, with the different shifts now, the 12 on. 12 so, on, 12 off, right? Yeah. So what we know is if, it's a, if, it's, if you're on day, it's not as big of an issue. If you're on night, it's a disruption. It's a disruption to your normal circadian rhythm, and it is the highest depressor of heart rate variability. Additionally, uh, and, and may, hopefully you know this, right? Law enforcement, for the most part, is a sedentary job until it's not, right? So it's for you sitting here for eight hours, and then I ask you to run flat out for 200 meters. 
it's, it's a hard, hard job. And that cardiovascularly is difficult to deal with. So that, from the standpoint of just the constant sort of percolating under stress, and then these spikes in acute stress is, is a real detriment. At night is the worst, right? So they've gone to some, you know, uh, different uh, shift work types where we, they, work, they work an eight and they work like a rotating eight that they find on those ones where it's at night. It, just, it takes two days to recover from. Danny. Do you know if anybody's studying this in healthcare workers? I'm thinking of nurses, doctors, maybe yep. those who are in ER. It's, it, we haven't seen the studies out yet. Um, I know that there's two studies um, uh, with a different kind of monitor uh, on, on the ring, called an aura ring, uh, with COVID workers. Um, so mm. that, that's soon to be out. I've seen some of the preliminary stuff through Italy with that. Hotbed. Yeah. So you were, oh gosh, it's really loud. Sorry. So you were talking about everything in moderation and then exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Mm -hmm. So how does overtraining or overexercise affect this information, like in the same way that stress does or in different ways because it's kind of good but kind of bad? Yeah, so, if, so we have a, a kind of a triangle uh, between the pituitary gland, um, the hypothalamus, and the adrenal gland. And so all three of those kind of circle around and they, they're the moderators of a hormone called cortisol. Right? So everybody, oh, cortisol, we hear that's bad. Stress hormone, it's a great hormone. Kicks your liver into gear and makes you produce sugar. That's all it really does. Um, but if that is always doing that, and, we, and then we ingest extra sugars into our diet, that's where cortisol becomes problematic. So then we start laying down fat. Exercise is a cortisol stimulator. It actually stimulates it acutely, but it dissipates. The body uh, uh, metabolizes it within two hours. So exercise and physical stress and mental stress, we see the same acute spikes in cortisol. All three of them have the same depressant effect on HRV. The difference is the pharmacology in the musculature is a resetter. So it, it doesn't allow that cortisol spike to suppress the HRV as much as the other two. Um, so it has to deal with um, quality of muscle and how long those muscles are contracting, right? But there is a tipping point in your question in terms of overtraining. Um, in those times where the, it was red, were times where the volume and intensity was very high for me and it really pushed me down into a tank and so I had to modulate out of that. So my typical training cycle was a three week run up and I knew it was gonna happen and a one week sort of 30% modulation down in volume and intensity. Then I would run up again, and I would see that starting to trend down. And so that's why you kind of see it go up and down, up and down, right? But the overall trend was that training effect. So if you can modulate recovery correctly, whether that's daily recovery or weekly recovery at one day off or, or a training cycle recovery, you can actually avoid overtraining syndromes. Good question. Yes. For how long would you need to have the depressed HRV before it damages your heart? It's not really a damage to the heart, right? It's just that the heart is now uh, being so overly regulated that it cannot react to the changes. So now, think about it, it's um, the old adage, use it or lose it kind of thing, right? Um, so if I, if I break my arm and it gets put in a cast for six weeks, the muscles will atrophy. The heart is no different. If I, if I am in a depressed state and those are really regulated, then the heart muscles are not being activated correctly and they will not stretch correctly. So then when you want them to do that and you have to have them to do that, in the case of the firefighters or Leo, we're going to have a problem because those heart, it's like pulling at your hamstring. I have to go on a sprint at that point. We're going to have some heart damage because the heart uh, demand is too high at that point. So it's that long-term depression of that coupled with high activity. Question? Yes, ma'am. Back over there. That's okay. I'm 
That's okay. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> How useful are wearable devices for monitoring heart things? And if they are useful, what are they useful for? I mean, I have it, and I'm kind of addicted to it, but I don't really know why. <laughs> So they're, they're useful, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. They're useful by providing us data. I'm a, I love data, data's my friend, I'm married to her. I mean, she's a CPA, but for real, she's data. <laughs> um, so we can have that good relationship with data or we can have a really bad relationship with data, what we call analysis paralysis, right? And so we, we hand these out to firefighters not kidding, for the first three days, they're like, what'd you get, 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 like every hour. And they're texting me, like, hey, I got this, is that bad, is that good, is that, am, I, am I dying? Um, no, you're good, you're good, fine, you're good. My heart rate's 120, it's normally 120, shut up, go back, you're in the fire, you're in a fire. You know, I don't know what to tell you, you're in a fire. So they're good for monitoring long trends. That's the easiest way I can put it. A, a week is not a long trend. Two weeks is a good trend to start. A month is a great trend. Three months better, six months, woo-hoo. So monitor what's happening to you long-term based on your actions, right? So we're good scientists here. We have intervention, data, results, analysis. Like we, now we go back and say, how, did we, how good was that? So if you can look at that and say, here's what I'm doing, a new exercise program. How effective is it? What's, what are the effects on my body? Here's a new diet plan. What's the effects on my body? I cut alcohol, Bob. I cut alcohol out. Here's the effects on my body. Whew, HRV goes through the roof. All right, so cause and effect long term. That's probably the best way that I would recommend any wearable technology. What is your long term? Right? Thank you so much. If y'all will please give another round of applause for our speakers. Um, that concludes our Lions Lecture for the spring semester. I always appreciate getting the um, alternative views, whether it be a charge to be more aware of the impact that we have and how we can be connected with our local systems or a charge to be more impact, uh, connected to ourselves and maybe do better for ourselves. I have really appreciated getting to listen to our speakers this last semester. Uh, we do anticipate having a new lineup for for the fall semester. Um, so please keep a lookout on our newsletter, the university's newsletter, as we announce those dates and our speakers for the next year. So uh, greatly appreciate your time tonight. Thank you to our wonderful bartender as well. And um, we hope to see you in the fall.